Hello and welcome to the big picture. Faced with Indian as well as international pressure to control terrorism emanating from its soil, Pakistan today found itself a target of another deadly militant attack which killed at least 60 people and injuring many more at a police training center on the outskirts of Quetta in Balochistan. The ghastly attack led by three militants killed, by many police, killed many police trainees while injuring over 120 people. Pakistan has been witnessing regular terror attacks within its territory from ultra-Sunni factions, mainly attacking Shia, Ahmadi and Christian minorities. Today's attack, however, is a direct attack on a government establishment. During this year, this is the eighth incident in Pakistan in which already nearly 300 people have lost their lives and many hundreds injured. From the time Benazir Bhutto was killed in an attack in 2007, Pakistan has seen over two dozen major terror incidents in which over 6,200 people have been killed. Meanwhile, after the late last night's Quetta attack, Pakistan officials, including the Chief Minister of Balochistan, has blamed India for the incident. However, it has been strongly refuted by Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, who has said it may have been a case of non-state actors nurtured by Pakistan being involved. Today, we will discuss the ghastly attack where it is coming from and how it will affect the region. To discuss this, I have with me TCA Raghavan, India's former High Commissioner to Pakistan, Rana Banerjee, former Special Secretary, Cabinet Secretariat, Commodore retired Uday Bhaskar, Director, of Society for Policy Studies, Vinod Sharma, political editor, Hindustan Times, and on the phone line from Islamabad is, Pak is Imtiaz Alam, senior journalist. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Raghavan, Mr. Raghavan, is this attack something which is, which is something which you would have expected it or you, you think that this is, this is another major surprise as far as Pakistan is concerned? Well, it's not entirely a surprise because such attacks have been periodically taking place. It's also difficult to predict as to what would be the direction of the attack and what would be the target. <coughs> because there is a certain random nature to them. But one fact is very clear that in the past decade or decade and a half, there's virtually been no single institution of the Pakistan state which has not been targeted in this manner. Whether it is the military, whether it is the army, whether it is the navy, whether it is the air force, whether it is judicial institutions, whether it is police, or whether it is administrative uh, institutions. Each and every one of them has been repeatedly targeted but the question really is, and this is really the central point, whether despite such overwhelming evidence that policies which have nurtured terrorist groups are turning themselves on the Pakistan state, despite this evidence, why there is no change of policy, that is really the central question which Pakistan has have had to address for the past decade and a half. And so far, there is no real evidence that it has successfully addressed that question. That's a very interesting uh, point which you have made, Mr. Raghavan. Let me get Imtiaz Alam on, on, on this. Imtiaz, how do, I mean, how do you react to this statement of Mr. Raghavan? You know that this is something which Pakistan has, has been facing for a long time, but the policy doesn't seem to have changed. Im, Imtiaz, I think, is disconnected there. Uh, Vinod, how do you look at this? Well, you see, do, you do you agree with Mr. Raghavan? Yes, I agree with him that, uh, I mean, in so far as the Pakistani assertion that they have been a victim of terror is concerned, there's an element of truth in that. But then that element of truth is somewhat diluted by the inability to act against groups which are so active against India. Uh, you see this, today's uh, uh, group which, which had uh, allegedly attacked the, uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, facility in Quetta. I mean, this group was also responsible for the killing of Daniel Pearl. They were the, also the ones held responsible for the 2013 killing of Hazaras and then the attack on the Sri Lankan team. It was the same group. This is a splinter group from Anjuman e Sipahi Saiba, which is a Sunni supremacist uh, outfit. Uh, you know, uh, and there, this is a splinter group from that. And mind you, it was this group uh, whose, uh, uh, whose, whose head, when he was killed in a police encounter, that they killed the state home minister uh, of Punjab, Khanzada, uh, Suja Khanzada. Yeah, they were the ones who killed him. Now, 
it is quite obvious that the Pakistani state is either unable to contain them or is unwilling to contain them. And I can understand that insofar as these groups which are holed up in the eastern enclaves uh, like uh, Jaisi Muhammad, like lashkar e taiba that the, uh, you know, Zarbayan type of an operation is not possible against them. This has to be a police intelligence based action which has to be taken against them because the kind of population which is there and this is the heart of Pakistan, not the borders with Afghanistan. I can understand all those difficulties. But those difficulties can be faced and surmounted only when there is a policy line declared very clearly that these people have no place uh, in Pakistan. Now the question is that, well, you decide that these people have no place in Pakistan, but in the interregnum, in, in the interregnum since you started nurturing them, started training them, and now uh, to the stage that they have reached, they are a force unto themselves. And to take on them would mean the Pakistani state and the Pakistani government of the day reconciling to the idea of a lot of ferment in Punjab, uh, which is relatively peaceful today. Okay, you know, reconciling to the Mr. Banerjee, recal reconciling to this idea, you know, why is it reconciling if it is reconciling? Second, you know, all these groups, do they have, there are four or five groups which have been operating, which have been responsible, have claimed responsibility, not just in this attack, in the several attacks in the past. Do they have a common motive? Is it something that, that, that the government of Pakistan would encourage that, that motive behind these kind of attacks? You see, this attack has been organized most probably by the lashkar e -Jhangvi. The lashkar e -Jhangvi has been resurgent since the last one year after the killing of Malik Ishaq. And uh, gradually it has shifted base uh, to across the Afghan border. And there they have now new paymasters, the IS Khorasan or uh, the Jamaatul Ahrar, they are all now uh, regional affiliates who seem to be uh, coalescing together in a loose way to justify uh, the money that they receive through sensational acts of this nature. But the focus of the lashkar e -Jhangvi in the past has been anti-Shia and anti-Hazara in Quetta. Uh, the Quetta wing of the lashkar e -Jhangvi was earlier headed by Usman Saifullah Kurd. He was a relative of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He had earlier been arrested in 2003-2004, taken to an anti-terrorism court custody in Baluchistan in Quetta, but he escaped from there in 2008, he and his lieutenant. <coughs> in last year, just before Malik Ishaq was eliminated, Usman Saifullah Kurd was also killed. But now Daud Badini, his lieutenant, has research. No, Mr. Banerjee, my question is this. You are saying that you know anti-Shia attacks have, yes. have been taking place by this, this group and maybe other groups also. But it, today's attack is not... Is no, not it's anti-establishment. It's anti-establishment. Anti I also said... And also the point made by Mr. Raghavan, <laughs> that in the past several years, no institution has been left uh, no, that's untouched. Absolute, that's absolutely true. But uh, the lashkar e -Jhangvi has had a love-hate relationship with the Pakistani establishment. In the past, they have used... The establishment has used them to counter, you see, the Baluch nationalists in, in Baluchistan to divert attention and to, you know, have these diversionary killings of Shias and Hazaras in Quetta. So this has been encouraged. So, so uh, you are saying yes. you are saying that the Pakistan government yes. may, may, be may have may have flirted with them to do these things. At, you, at some yes. point of time in the yes. past. And there was evidence Not some, in the present. Yes, there was evidence some time past because Mushtaq Sukheda, one of the very uh, you know uh, uh, famous police officers who was sent specially to Balochistan as IG Quetta, he was asked to appease the Lashkar e Jhangvi there. Uh, because he had previous contacts with him. Now he's come back as IG Punjab. Okay, let me, uh, I think we have got uh, Imtiaz on the phone. Imtiaz, you're there, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Imtiaz, you know, sorry we got disconnected when we were, I don't know how much you've heard, but, uh, you know, Vinod Sharma was uh, saying that how much is the government willing to, to control these groups? Because these are these are groups which have been operating for quite some time right from the time Daniel Pearl's uh, case till now. But this group, especially which has, which has been responsible, which has claimed responsibility today, lashkar e -Jangvi, you know, why is the government, is the government unwilling to control them or is unable to control them? You know that lashkar e -Jangvi has been the target of the government for the last so many years. And their top guy and their main uh, person was killed in a police encounter in Punjab. Uh, Mr. Ishaq and lashkar e -Jhangvi is on the run and they have joined other extremist organizations like IS and 
they have connection, developed connection with other international uh, terrorist bodies. So that is not true that uh, they have love and hate relationship. With, they, they, they might have at some point of time, but Lashkar Jangri was always, uh, always suspected because of his very sectarian uh, uh, attitude and the killings they have done in the past of the Shias. Uh, this is a very, uh, this is yet another uh, terrorist uh, activity targeting uh, uh, security uh, law enforcement agencies uh, training center. Uh, and it has happened in uh, Afghanistan earlier as well. So now uh, there are other groups who are taking responsibility, but still it is not clear who has done this. But investigations are going on. And of course, uh, like India and Pakistan, it is typical that the uh, provincial government and administration is uh, raising an accusing finger against uh, uh, against the raw. Uh, but it is uh, it is not certain. It is not clear. It is not established. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I think uh, regarding the Pakistan policy, that after the uh, attack on the army public school. We saw a very big, massive operation in North Waziristan and elsewhere. Almost all the tribal areas have been cleared now. And it has been incremental policy. And we have seen that uh, that policy has now uh, has been moving towards other groups as well, who were considered good Taliban or who were not being targeted, came under, uh, under target. So. Uh, this, oh, I see and hope that uh, there have been a lot of meetings going on and consultations uh, among uh, the political leadership and the military officials. And uh, uh, I think uh, 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 the countrywide intelligence-based operations are now expanding, and they have been uh, uh, taking place for the last two, almost one year. But I see that there will be some... Uh, 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 there will be some uh, greater frequency of these operations. Okay. And after this attack again, uh, Pakistan is uh, on notice by the extremists and the terrorists that either we stand against them or b become the victim of their machinations and brutal okay. uh, I think Imtiaz, Imtiaz, Vinod, Vinod wants to ask you something, Vinod. No, Imtiaz, you see, uh, of course there has been uh, quite an energetic operation, let's uh, agree, on your western borders with Afghanistan. But when we talk about what's happening on the eastern enclaves, you know, I mean, these people, it's, it's a well-known secret that there are certain organizations that, that, that receive political patronage uh, from the government of the day in Punjab, and they are politically unsure whether if they take on them wholeheartedly, fully, full-bloodedly, uh, whether they'll be able to uh, face the blowback which may come because these people have, have been allowed to set up institutions across the state and uh, uh, they have been allowed to participate more actively than even the government agencies in certain relief operations uh, on account of uh, natural disasters. So they have attraction with the section of the people and is, does the government have the political will to take on them despite the attraction that they have with the people there? You know that on 28th of this month, uh, Defense of Pakistan Council, which is a conglomerate of Islamic parties, and which also include uh, uh, Lashkar-e Taiba or Dawat Wal Irshad, and uh, the government will be facing the wrath of the, uh, these uh, banned uh, outfits. And uh, almost 4,000 of their uh, 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 people, their name has been put in the fourth shit schedule. Fourth schedule is for uh, uh, for the extremists and the terrorists. And their ID cards have been cancelled and their accounts have been seized. So you will see that in the next uh, weeks and months, you will see that there will be, uh, the state will be act getting active against uh, those elements who had so far been spared or who had not been targeted in the past. I okay. think uh, the time is moving to that. Does it, does it include, does it include the organizations which have been targeting India? Uh, I have already told you that on 28th... You said Lashkar-e-Taiba. What about Jaish-e-Mohammed? 
before before the dharna of uh, uh, the uh, Imran Khan on 2nd November, okay. on 28th of this month, these organizations are coming to Islamabad in a big procession. And uh, there is uh, this open. There is going to be an open conflict okay. and confrontation. Okay. And they, their four thousand of their men have been put on the schedule four. Okay. And policemen uh, knows this. Okay. Uh, uh, know this that what is meant by this? Their ID cards have been cancelled. Okay. And their accounts have been confiscated. Okay. Uday, Uday, is this a case of state policy of using militants backfiring? Is, there, is that the case? I think the short answer is yes. Hmm. That the Pakistani establishment over the decades, going back frankly to General Ziaul Haqstein, have invested, I think, in different groups for different political purposes, some long term, some short term. But going back to what uh, Raghavan, Manu, Ambassador Raghavan was saying, you know, when we look at the ecosystem that Pakistan has now nurtured, I would say as an analyst that it might be slightly misleading to see this as a binary that it is only the Pakistani army and the intelligence agencies who are supporting some of these groups and that the so-called civilian establishment, the political establishment, is its hands are clean. I don't think that's the case. My reading is that over the years, there are many political parties, including those that we associate with Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, who over the last 20, 30 years have flirted with these groups, have benefited from their support. And that today, is the, the point which Vinod was making with them, they are, they are the political will now having flirted with them for so well, long. Well, I think, again, you know, the political will is not just black and white. My sense reading, you know, whatever we've seen of Pakistan is that there is one constituency, including Mr. Nawaz Sharif, who has benefited, if you recall, from the support of the army itself. I mean, his becoming prime minister in 1990 was enabled by the Pakistani military, by Rawal Pindi. In Punjab, if you look at the way in which his own party has positioned itself, particularly when there was a very, very intense contestation with the PPP at the time, you saw that there were elements within Pakistan's Punjab who had benefited from, quote-unquote, the patronage of the party in Punjab, which is the family associated with Mr. Nawaz Sharif. So my point is that today, I think, personally, as, again, a security analyst, I believe the Pakistani military is not unable so I think that question, I would give a definitive answer in saying they have the capability. Yes, there are sections even within the Pakistani military now who see themselves as empathizing with the groups, whether it is the Jamaat, the Lashkar or even the TTP. Because there is a strong constituency, as I see it, within the Pakistani establishment, not just the military, even the state, who believe in this, say, for instance, sectarian ideology, that the Shia is to be targeted. After all, if the Ahmadiyya was targeted in Pakistan, it was because of this ecosystem. So I think the blowback, you know, coming back to your first observation, regrettably, whether it was a school in Peshawar or what we are seeing now in Quetta in terms of the, the, and the college, hospital, police, the hospital attack is all, I think, this particular blowback. And I think this is the decision that maybe, and I say this very, very, with trepidation, not trepidation, but cautiously, the new army chief, when General Rahil Sharif retires, in November, end November, as is the plan. If, if, he if so, I agree. But, you know, then we also have November 2. I think this Imran Khan's march is also going to give us an indication about the ability of the system to do that which is deemed right as far as the state and the citizen are concerned. Okay. Mr. Mr. Raghavan, Mr. Raghavan, as far as, you know, the, this blame game which, which has begun there, directly attacking... At, Blaming India for this attack is—is is this something new, or is—is is, as they've been going on? What is the what is the motive behind you know blaming India? This has in been this? going on. Uh, this has been going on for a number of years, and to 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 borrow a, a simile from cricket, it is playing a committed stroke. <laughs> I don't think it is very uh, important or very significant. But uh, the point uh, which. Uh, uh, Uday Bhaskar was making really is a very valid one that uh, we need to understand from an analyst point of view, uh, terrorism in Pakistan is a structural uh, problem. So therefore, results will not be evident overnight. The question is of how does the government signal that it is prepared to change uh, policy and that it is changing policy. Those kind of political signals, the outside world has not been able to see. Mr. And in particular, sorry, sorry. Afghanistan and India, we have not been able to see at all. Mr. Raghavan, sorry, the point which was made by uh, Mr. Imtiaz Alam, 
saying that you know after the uh, school attack army army school attack there has been some kind of a uh, effort on the part of the government as well as maybe the military also to 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 control these groups do you think that these have all been half hearted attempts no i believe the 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 action which the pakistan army took after the peshawar school attack and in fact that action began even before the attack was not half hearted at all it was a fully committed and the full range of force available to them was used but the fact is that you cannot given the nature of the terrorist uh, threat and the nature of terrorist groups which exist you cannot direct that action against some groups and and try to insulate other groups uh, from that action since you believe that the other groups can be used for political aims in afghanistan and india that is the failure of policy and that is what is wrong with the policy being followed okay rana rana banerji the, the you know today the some of the uh, people there the chief minister of balochistan the director inspector general they are all talking of a of this attack being controlled from afghanistan what is the afghanistan connection here well they have picked up the intercept from a lashkar e jhangvi exile based in along with one of the groups there so several of the ttp groups or factions uh, which were driven out from nwfp from uh, uh, fata have taken refuge in parts of afghanistan so the jamaat ul ahrar and uh, also the lashkar e jhangvi they may have got new paymasters there the is khorasan claims that they are their affiliates now so the intercept is there that's a very technical piece of evidence that is available which has been mentioned by uh, major lieutenant major general sher afghan the ig frontier corps of balochistan so taking that as a basis uh, we we have to accept that these groups are now operating from there the august 8 attack against the lawyers in the hospital was claimed also by jamaat ul ahrar so so where does the is come here because is also has been claiming responsibility IS, for this attack is comes in only as a proxy because they want to show a presence of their group or affiliation has there region. been any evidence of their presence in that only or is it just claims that they are making just claims to, by some splinter faction leaders uh, of the ttp who have said that now we are with the is otherwise the ideology of the is as such Uh, has not made much headway inside uh, core pakistan area we not you know i think that uh, uh, you know organizations like tehreek e taliban pakistan are quasi is you know they don't believe in democracy they don't uh, they reject the system that is, exists in pakistan today and they think that uh, unless i mean there there is need for them to struggle for uh, a complete islamic kind of governance in that country which is not there at this time uh, and much of their targets have been uh, they are widely perceived to be anti pakistan you know uh, and by uh, implication pro india i mean uh, and i think that when isi blames rnaw and rnaw uh, blames isi I, i see i mean on a lighter side a great degree of uh, you know professional respect for each other maybe <laughs> you know but 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 may i say one thing <laughs> may i say one thing that not all these claims are right because you see it is very easy for somebody today given the policy shift on balochistan that indian government has uh, has affected uh, to bring this element in and this also helps locally the politician and the army and others who are trying to uh, you know sort of beat down uh, groups the nationalist groups which are active in balochistan you know to paint them you, as you pro think, india you think that is one of the reasons why they are openly alleging that you know india no, no, but i I, but i suspect that because the point is that you know you know this is this is the tragedy of our times that within minutes of an attack happening we know from where the attack is coming and then after a few weeks we decide that no this was not the organization there is another organization we did this it like in the case of uri earlier it was jaish e mohammed now we are saying is lashkar e taiba so i think that this hastening up of 
conclusions and to feed the media with some stories. No, it doesn't help. If in, I may add, yes. see, today, uh, there's an attempt also at deliberate obfuscation. Today, Ahmad Rashid, who's a fairly respected, you know, yeah. strategic security Commented analyst from Pakistan, in the West particularly, on Al Jazeera, he needlessly brought up uh, that among those who are or possibly could be behind this could be Baluch nationalists. I mean, nobody in the yeah. right senses with any yeah. good, uh, uh, you know, uh, suggests that this is a, uh, their action. In fact, Pakistani commentators themselves, have, other sane commentators have themselves said that no, this one is not from the Baluch. This is definitely, uh, you know, a faction of the TTP or Lashkar-e Jhangvi. Imtiaz, what, what, what is the yeah. motive? You, what is the motive you see behind this attack? Uh, you know, especially since. Especially since it has been, it, it is on a government establishment and not on some minorities, as we have seen in the past, several such attacks have have targeted minorities. I have to first make a remark about uh, uh, about the utterances of other discussions or analysis yes. being made there. That uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif is not a Deobandi; he is a Brailvi. And he belongs to different school. And the support he got in the election was not from Lashkar Taiba. This is totally misconception. He had a support of another sectarian group, of course, but that group has also been proscribed and banned. And they are under you now great scrutiny. Uh, you see that uh, they are being put in the uh, Khana Four, which is called uh, Section Four. Uh, and then. There is uh, a great realization here uh, that we have to sort out all these groups. They cannot be good or bad Taliban, and they cannot be our and their Taliban. Yes, uh, India, uh, the current conflict between India and Pakistan and the kind of war uh, uh, media we see, uh, that is helping, in, in fact, these elements. Uh, because as the pressure build up on the eastern border, the attention is diverted to the eastern border, and these people find their way and they get get some space and uh, breathing space uh, to again uh, get active and come and attack like this, what they have done yesterday. So what I'm saying is that there is uh, a proxy war also going on. If you are an objective analyst, and I have great respect for regard for the, the friends sitting in this panel, that they must also note that yes, there is a big proxy war going on. Uh, Rob may not be involved in last night's uh, operation or some other uh, uh, subversion or some other terrorist activity. But there is, uh, uh, one can feel and say, and there is some empirical evidence now coming up, that yes, a three-way proxy war is going on. Okay. And the beneficiaries are the terrorists. Okay. For example, the terrorists who got uh, asylum, who got some space in Afghanistan, come and attack in Pakistan. Okay. And the terrorists who run from Afghanistan, they take some refuge somewhere in the border region in Pakistan. Okay, Imtiaz, Imtiaz, sorry, we have run out of time, yes. but your points are all, are all well taken. I think uh, you know this is a this is a discussion which will have to continue. This is a, a problem which Pakistan is facing, which will have to be. We, we, we do empathize with killings of people there, but how the how the problems between the two countries is resulting in these two things is something which needs more discussion. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with Andrew in the big picture same time tomorrow.